today we shall discuss the, the possible different abnormalities that occur in hemodynamics and how we diagnose uh, certain diseases uh, using hemodynamics. Um, as you know, there are things that you can easily diagnose by saturations, as we showed. It's not easy to diagnose an ASD by a simple image because unless you do a TEE for the patient, a long time ago, there was no echo, and there was only when there was an echo, it was only in motor. So we have to diagnose the ASD by uh, clinically, of course, first, and then we have to go to the cath lab so we can do the auction, and there is an auction step up in the right atrium, and so on. And that's how you diagnose. Other diseases you diagnose the diagnosis is by hemodynamics, like a, a, a valve stenosis, for example, whether it be aortic or pulmonary or mitral. It's more, more hemodynamics. Apart from the oxygen saturations, an angiogram can help you in the diagnosis. For example, a BSD. A BSD will have an oxygen step up in the right vent because that's where the BSD pours. It pours the oxygenated blood into the RV. So you have the oxygen step up in the RV, but you can also see it when you do an angiogram. So this is also. So all these images help you in the diagnosis. Today, with the advances in echo and MRI and all that, you don't need to do all that. Cat lab. Cat lab is usually used just for interventions or for certain times when, when there is a discrepancy between the clinical and the imaging and the even to a cat to make sure of your diagnosis. So uh, we shall go uh, with the different uh, uh, diseases. This is an example. For example, as you see, this is a, a left ventriculogram. And you have an ECG on the top, as you can see very clearly. Okay, and that's very important for your um, for your timing. And uh, you can see the scale here is 200. The reason why they put the scale as 200 because the left ventricular pressure is very high. So you need to put it so you can measure properly the scale. The aortic. Uh, the aortic uh, pressure, as you can see, <coughs> is within the scale of 100. So if you had done the 100, the aortic would have appeared, but the left ventricle would have been outside the, you see what I mean? So now you have a gradient of around, that's 170, and the aorta is 119, so you have a gradient of about, whatever it is, about 35, 40 millimeters mercury between the, the peak left ventricle and the peak aortic. So it's peak to peak. This is a peak rate. And this diagnosis that there is an outflow tract obstruction of the left ventricle, not necessarily a valve. Okay. Uh, we have, of course, as you know, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, obstructive, the obstructive type, and we have the subaortic membrane. Those are the other types of uh, aortic stenosis. Uh, so all this shows you is that there is a gradient between the left ventricle and the ascending aorta, which is done by pullback. I keep my catheter in the left ventricle, and preferably not a pigtail catheter, uh, uh, what you call it, an end hole catheter. And then you take it back slowly, very slowly, across the valve into the ascending aorta, and you get this pressure. Okay? The pigtail catheter has many holes along, along its end. The last five centimeters of the pigtail catheter have holes. So you will get a hybrid pressure. You will, you will have the left ventricular pressure and as you pull it back up, you have to go far away so you can get pure aortic pressure. If you get it too close to the valve, you'll have a hybrid pressure, which is not, you will not be able to read anything. That's why we use an end hole catheter when you're doing a pullback, preferably. Of course, now with the experience, we know. So we, we use the, pill, the pigtail. <coughs> we put it in the left ventricle, we take the pressure, we do our angiogram, and then we pull back by drawing it all the way up. Of course, we already know beforehand that clinically probably it's a valvular aortic stenosis, especially if you hear a click. Okay? A sub-aortic stenosis, you will not hear a click. Remember that. Mm -hmm. And of course, I have a trophic cardiomyopathy. So this is probably valvular aortic stenosis. Again, this is the same as the previous one, but this was done simultaneous pressures. That means two transducers were used 
to get you the simultaneous pressure. One transducer had the catheter in the left ventricle, and the other transducer had the catheter in the air. So this is not a pullback, this is simultaneous pressure. Compare it to the first one. The first one is a, a line and then continues into the air. Okay? This one is two catheters, each one in a chamber, and they take simultaneous pressures at the same time. The thing wrong, wrong with, this, uh, with this, there is no electrocardiogram with this. Uh, it may have been there, but it's obstinate. You can't see it maybe from the... From, but this is how you always make your timing, especially when you want to find out the left ventricular and diastolic pressure. As I said, the end diastolic pressure of the left ventricle may be with the Q wave or peak R. Okay? You draw an imaginary line with the Q wave, and usually this will point at the end diastolic pressure in the left ventricle. And this is again simultaneous pressure tracing from the left ventricle and the aorta in a patient with aortic stenosis. You can see. It's very clear, okay? That shadowed area is the area under the uh, LV, which is the, the area of the stenosis, okay? And the peak to peak is that, those two lines that you see. Okay? This and this, these are the, this is the peak to peak gradient which in a um, hundred up to an, a, a, a gradient of 80, which is very severe aortic stenosis. Okay. Can anybody tell me what this is? This is the, uh, the left ventricular pressure. Don't worry, don't worry, go ahead. Alaikum salam. Try. Can't hear. You have to be louder. Don't worry. I'm not going to eat you. You think the atrium contracts strongly in a patient with aortic stenosis, creating a fourth heart sound? The left atrium? Yes, because the pressure in the left ventricle is high, and diastolic pressure is high, so the atrium contracts strongly. When it contracts strongly, it gives you this little much, even in the left ventricular pressure. Okay? And that also gives you the fourth heart sound that you hear when you listen to a patient with valvular aortic stenosis. Okay? Let's see how we can differentiate between hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy and fixed aortic stenosis. Okay. As you know, in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, the site of obstruction is inside the left ventricle. It's not at the back. It's below the back. And so you get this kind of a pressure pull back. Okay. You see this? Here is the left ventricle. And then, as you pull your catheter from the apex of the left ventricle backwards, you get a gradient, which is this. All you can see here is that this is an intraventricular gradient. And then there is no gradient between that and the aorta. Okay? So therefore, you have the ascending aorta with a pressure of, say, 90. As you go into the valve, right below the valve, the pressure still is 90, but then when you go to the apex, the pressure becomes 120 or 130. So the pressure, so that the, the gradient is inside the ventricle, the obstruction is within the ventricle. There is a significant systolic gradient within the, within the left ventricular cavity and the left ventricular outflow tract, and the aortic pressure waveforms exhibit, uh, exhibit a spike and dome contour which goes with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, okay? Spike, and then a dome. This is also one of the things that helps you to diagnose hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Can 
anybody tell me how extracystose premature ventricular contractions can help in diagnosing hypertrophic cardiomyopathy? We've mentioned it before. I gave the hemodynamics before. How can an how can a premature ventricular contraction help me differentiate between a fixed aortic obstruction and a hypertrophic cardiomyopathy? It's very important that you know that. Anybody wants to volunteer? What happens with a, a premature ventricular contraction? Yeah, I know what you're trying to say. Yeah. The post axis systolic pause makes the ventricle fill more. And therefore, the contraction that follows, that ensues that, is strong. When the contraction is strong, the obstruction becomes more. So the left ventricular pressure increases because of the contraction, of the strong contraction, but the aortic pressure decreases because the obstruction is more from the strong contraction. In fixed, no, they're together, okay? That's how you can do it. We can even diagnose it at the bedside. How? This it. Where you're feeling the pulse or the carotid. In the post excess systolic beat, in the patient with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, the carotid pulse becomes weak. Okay? The same. Here is another example of a dynamic obstruction. A dynamic obstruction means an obstruction that changes with maneuvers. In this case, the maneuver is a valsalva. Okay? What happens with the valsalva maneuver in general? What, what happens to the circulation, the hemodynamics? What happens with the valsalva maneuver? This is physiology, guys. You should know. intrathoracic pressure increases very much, right? And therefore, the venous return decreases because the pressure in the chest is not, is not, and therefore, the venous return decreases, right? When the venous return decreases, exactly, all right? So that means that the, the, the obstruction will become more because the ventricle does not get the, uh, the, the same amount of blood, it becomes less, the left ventricle gets less blood, and therefore the obstruction is more, and you get a decrease in, in the thing. And the murmur, okay? And that is why in patients we suspect hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, we do the maneuver, and we put the stethoscope on his chest, and while he is doing the maneuver, you, you listen to him before, and at the time of the maneuver, and as is the anti-releases. Uh, usually, you, you can hear clearly that the murmur increases. We don't do this test anymore because it's dangerous. The isoprenaline provocation in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy because you can invite arrhythmias. There is no really no, no need. It used to be done before because before echo there was nothing much else to do except to diagnose things like that by provocation and so forth. Now with echo you can see the obstruction, you, now you can do it by valsalva, you can do other things by sitting up and um, squatting and things like this. You can uh, dynamically change uh, the hemodynamics. But this is an example. Isoprel, as you know, increases contractility and therefore the obstruction and so the murmur the, the aortic pressure is less, but the murmur increases, okay? Dilated cardiomyopathy, hemodynamics is not yeah, something very important to remember, at least in, as regards the pressures. But because the ventricle is weak, so the upstroke is slow, is uh, slower and uh, not uh, slowly goes up and down. 
okay? But of course, there is no gradient. There is no systolic gradient between the left ventricle and the aorta. And uh, the, you diagnose dilated cardiomyopathy most often and most frequently by echocardiogram, uh, especially when there is no other reason like hypertensive heart disease or ischemic heart disease or simple dilated cardiomyopathy. It may be ischemic dilated cardiomyopathy. That, of course, goes with the patient's history, whether he has had ischemic events or infarction before, and uh, which is very common. The end-stage heart failure that we see often in the department is as a result of uh, ischemic heart disease. Quiz. لسه شايفين واحد ايه اورتكس نوتس بص تاني ولا سب اور مش كده الاوبتراكشن از انسايد ذا فينت صح ذير از نو جراديانت بتوين the ventricle and the aorta. But there is a gradient between this ventricle and the, the ventricle, so the, 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 the two ventricles, there is a gradient. So the obstruction is inside, okay? Always remember that. Intraventricular pressure gradient. It is an intraventricular pressure gradient. You don't need to uh, say what it is. Hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, when uh, it's a membrane, a subaortic membrane, well, uh, but you have to diagnose that this is intraventricular pressure. Okay, quiz. There are three pressures here: the left ventricle, and they are simultaneous. Therefore, three. Uh, transducers and three catheters in the patient. One in the left ventricle, one in the ascending aorta, and one in the femoral artery. Make your diagnosis. It may be, it could be also uh, femoral uh, as the uh, aortic obstruction, uh, yeah, any obstruction down from atherosclerosis, you don't know. Mm -hmm. Yani what you need to remember is that there is a gradient between, a peak gradient between the left ventricle and the aorta, right? And there's another gradient between the ascending aorta and the femoral artery. So there is an obstruction, probably valgrin, okay? And then somewhere in the aorta. This could be coarctation, could be uh, abdominal coarctation, and it could be uh, this disease of atherosclerosis at the, at the end, Smahe. With my which burger left? Lurish. Lurish is a chronic lower aortic obstruction. Okay. But if it's an aortic coarctation, so this patient has a syndrome. You remember what that syndrome is called. When there are multiple obstructions of the left ventricular outflow tract. Sometimes they also have a subaortic as well, and even mitral problems, parachute mitral valve. Quiz. What do you see in the first half? In the first half of the whole goes either. If you fair, it goes either right hand. They are separate. They are not continuous. If you cut here, what do you see here and here? In the first half, sinus tachycardia. In the second half, normal. Heart rate 70, 75. Right? The both side pressure. In the first half, with tachycardia, the pressure is low. After a fluid bolus, maktub, you gave a fluid bolus, okay? The pressure, 110, 120, and the heart rate, heady. 
ده كان ايه؟ يا مفتري هايبوفوليميا This is hypovolemia. Remember always in older people, dehydration is very common because they forget to drink. I got many in my office and I had to bring them to the hospital upstairs uh, on the fourth floor. They go in, they take fluids, they're fine, they go home. Okay, so, so this is an example. Always remember hypovolemia. Of course, this hypovolemia, maybe a road traffic accident, maybe anything, I mean, you know, uh, Yeah, so dehydration is common, you have to remember. Mm -hmm. yeah, I mean, especially if you have parents who are aging and together, you must remember that. Especially when they start telling you, we feel tired, we feel fatigued. Don't forget dehydration. You have one strong beat and one weak beat. Hmm? Yep. Pulse is alternate. If you feel it with your hands, you won't be able to feel the aorta, but you will be able to feel the radial or the femoral. You'll find one strong beat and one weak beat. The pulse has to be regular. Everybody remember. The pulse has to be regular to diagnose alternates. Because in AF, the pulse is irregular anyway. Okay? So remember, to diagnose alternates, the pulse has to be regular. Alright? Why? What happened? Why is the pulse? What is pulse of alternance? What does it signify? Heart failure. Cardiomyopathy. Exactly. Severe heart failure. Why? What happens? Yes. Not all the fibers of the left ventricle uh, recover to give you the next contraction. Some do and some don't. But by the time the other beat comes, they have all recovered and so they give you the high pulse. Okay? You understand what I said? Okay. As I said, it has to be regular. So you have to look at the ECG as well. Hmm? Pulses of demand, which may be pericardial effusion, cardiomyopathy, congestive heart failure. Amen. زي ما انت قلت بس يعني كان انت انت قلتها زي ما يكون انت شفتها قبل كده <تصفيق> لازم تفكر في السبب وتقول كذا حاجه ايه ده؟ اه ماله الاي سي جي؟ ايه رايك؟ Electrical alternance is different from pulses alternance. I mean, it's not necessary to have pulses alternance if there's electrical alternance. It's something different. Okay. This is the right atrial tracing. Probably you will never see it. Very few catheters. So, so this is this is where you will you will see a right atrial pressure tracings. All you know about the right atrium is what you see in the neck veins. Okay. The man, taban, when we did catheters, it was common to see a right atrial tracing, a wedge pressure tracing, which is a left atrial tracing, and so. On. Now it's not common.
Yeah. That's very good. Yeah. So that's very good. So, uh, you can go w when they have a patient with pulmonary hypertension, they're doing cat four, go and attend because you're going to see how they do the zero point, how they do the scale I was talking about when we started the cat and everything that's related to the, and how they measure the resistance. You see, all these things are things that you can see live. So you, you just have to check with the, with the residents when they have a patient with pulmonary hypertension that they're going to do a cat four. Okay, then you'll have a right ventricular tracing, right atrial tracing, and so on. You notice in, the, in this uh, tracing that the mean is around 3 to 5 millimeters mercury, the mean right atrial, and that the A wave is the highest wave, is the right. What's the highest wave in the left atrium? The V wave, exactly. Okay. And as you can see, the A wave is the atrial contraction. And then you have the X descent, which is disturbed by a little C wave, which is not very important, but the X descent happens when you feel the radial pulse. Always remember, you time your neck veins with the radial pulse. Because in the MD exam, I asked the doctor, where do you, how do you time the neck veins? And she started to flumber and then want the carotid and then by auscultation and that as if she had never examined the patient or even watched someone examining a patient. She didn't even watch someone examining the neck veins before. So remember, the neck veins, the jugular veins, are timed with the radial pulse. So when we say collapse, that means that the X descent collapses during the pulse. When we say filling, that means that the, the, X, the, the X is no more X. It becomes filled uh, during the pulse. Okay, like in tricuspid rigor, for example, or AF. Here they're telling you how you're advancing into the right heart with the swan gans catheter. SGC is swan gans catheter, which is balloon, a balloon tip catheter, okay? And then end hole. It has an end hole and then a balloon. Just behind the hole, there is a balloon. You go into your vein, you inflate the balloon, the jugular vein usually, or the subclavian. You, you go in, you inflate the balloon, it starts to float, and it goes into the right atrium, and you get this pressure, okay? So the initial chamber is the right atrium. Initial pressure waveforms, three positive deflections, and as you know, the AC and B wave, and then, they are follow and then there are three the X and Y descent, or two uh, deflections, or the X and Y descent. This is the usual. And this is, again, the right atrial uh, pressure tracing. I'm not going to repeat myself. If you want to know what they, they signify, you know the atrial systole is the A, the A wave. The C wave occurs with the closure of the tricuspid valve and the initiation of the atrial filling. And the v wave, v wave occurs with blood filling the atrium while the tricuspid valve is closed. You know these things, okay? Timing of the positive deflection. A wave occurs after the P wave, 60 to 80 milliseconds after. So remember that the electrical phenomena occur first, followed by the mechanical phenomena. Of course, electricity is much more quick. Than, uh, 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 so, so it's during the PR interval that you see the negative, the, the A wave. The C wave, when present, occurs at the end of the QRS complex. And the V wave peak occurs after the T wave. That's electrical. Okay. And this is your systole and diastole when you, can't, when, when you want to talk about the, the ECG timing of systole and diastole, not the ventricular timing, the ECG timing. So the systole occurs from the peak of the R wave to the end of the T wave. That's systolic. So when you hear a, a, a pan-systolic murmur, it, it, it will be in that area. Okay? And diastole occurs from the peak of the T wave to the next uh, Q wave. That's diastole. Atrial contraction is a part of diastole, of the diastolic phenomenon, okay? And when you hear an early diastolic murmur of aortic rigor, it will be in that, starting with the peak of the T wave, because it's early diastolic, right after. 
and you can time also this with your uh, atrial uh, wave form. You can time your system. This is all in the, if you remember, the, I showed you the slide of the, uh, the cardiac cycle. All that is there. That's why I see you have to learn it by heart. When the first sound is, when the second sound is, when a third sound will be, where it will be, when the opening snap will, where is the opening snap on the cardiac cycle. All this is very important because you know now when the valve, the mitral valve will open. It is right after the protodiastolic period or the isovolumic uh, relaxation period. So this, this isovolumic relaxation period is when all the valves are closed. So you cannot hear a murmur. Once the valve opens, you hear an opening snap. So now you know where the opening snap is after the second sound. With a little bit. Yeah, and you hear the second sound first and then the opening snap. You see the height of the A wave depends on the pressure needed to eject the blood forward. That's why I was telling you in the pressure tracing of the left ventricle, there was a little notch. That's the atrial notch because it needed to be strong contraction because there is aortic stenosis. So the left ventricle is thick, it has a high end diastolic pressure, and therefore the atrial needs to contract strongly. Okay. Whereas the height of the wheel wave, that's the atrial compliance and the volume of blood returning. As the atrium is compliant and the blood returns, it gives you the video. You know this, of course, by heart, you should. Elevated A wave in tricuspid stenosis and decreased right ventricular compliance, such as pulmonary hypertension and pulmonary stenosis. Just remember tricuspid stenosis, pulmonary stenosis, and pulmonary hypertension. This gives you a prominent A wave and sometimes a giant A wave, depending on how much. The, um, the canon A wave is when the atrium and ventricle contract together. And so the valve is closed. So therefore you have the contraction of the, the ventricle and the contraction of the atrium giving you a high uh, wave. And sometimes you get irregular canon waves in a patient with AV dissociation. And you can diagnose this at the bedside. Put your hand on the pulse and you look at the neck waves. Okay. You will find every now and then a big wave. That's a cannon wave. Absent A wave. About atrial fibrillation or standstill at atrial flux. Okay, uh, lot of fibrillation. Okay, elevated V wave. Tricuspid regurge, RV failure, reduced atrial compliance, like restricted myopathy, and so on but mainly tricuspid reverse. And of course, right ventricular failure means that the ventricle is dilated, the annulus of the tricuspid valve is dilated, and you have tricuspid reverse. So the X descent is prominent in tamponade. That is prominent X descent, meaning uh, an X descent which is clearly seen on the neck wave can happen with tamponade and right ventricular ischemia. Absent in atrial arrhythmias, such as and in tricuspid regurgitation, right atrial ischemia, and so on. An absent X descent in atrial arrhythmias. A V descent, the Y descent, Ozzy, I'm sorry, the Y descent, prominent in right side cardiomyopathy, tricuspid regurgitation. What's CCP? I can't remember. And absent Y descent in tricuspid stenosis and tamponade and right ventricular Chronic constrictive pericarditis. Oh, God. Okay. Pulmonary capillary wedge pressure. Because it is a reflection of the left atrial pressure, so the V wave is the highest. The right atrial pressure below, the A wave is the highest. Always remember, this is it. What, and we told you the mean of the right atrial pressure is three to five millimeters mercury. What's the mean of the left atrium? Eight to 10, nine to 11, okay, good day. 10 to 12, yani it has to be a little bit higher than the end diastolic pressure of the left ventricle. Okay. 
Because they thought you need the blood to go forward. And they put you the, the sounds here so you know when, when the sounds are time. S1 is here with opening of the uh, aortic and pulmonary, uh, with, uh, sorry, closure of the, the, the tricuspid and mitral valve. And the S2 is here with closure of the aortic and pulmonary valve. And this gives you system opening. S1 is the opening of the AV valve, and that, of course, you know, is the beginning of systole. And S2 is the end. Okay. And if you look here with the ECG, as we said, it starts with the QRS and ends with the end of the T1. Okay. <laughs> this is clearly shown. Sure. Between the left atrium and pulmonary capillary wedge? I think there probably is, but I never really, uh, we never really looked at it. I don't know if you know any uh, ideas. Yes. I d I'm not sure. I'm not sure. But you can see them clearly drawn here. So uh, yeah, I mean the, the differences are very m minor, minor differences, but they are shown here. And there is also the pulmonary occlusive pressure, where you use a swan gans catheter and you put it in a pulmonary artery and inflate the balloon. This may be a little bit different also from the capillary wedge pressure and the left atrial pressure, but minor differences again, not major differences. They all more or less mean the same thing. This is a giant A wave. Where does it happen? Hmm? Tricuspid stenosis, severe pulmonary stenosis can happen, but hmm? you see how uh, high it is. This is the CV wave pressure. This patient, what does this patient have? Yeah, probably severe tricuspid. Sometimes the patient may have tricuspid rigor, but you still have a systolic collapse, but the collapse is much smaller than usual. Yani it will not be a nice drawing. If you draw yani the thing, you can have mild tricuspid rigor and you still get a systolic collapse on the neck bone. So, so it has to be moderate to significant to, to show you a CV wave like this, as you see in this picture. This is a, a very clear uh, X descent, prominent X descent, which can go with tamponade, as we said, and a prominent Y descent, which can go with constrictive pericarditis. This is the M shape that they always told us. Can the many clinical problems? We used to go and uh, measure the pressures. I remember we used to put a, a transducer on the neck veins and uh, measure the neck vein uh, the atrial pressure. We used to do that. And then with the, with the eyeball, you can tell. You can tell. Come on, I'm going to here, and the sign is already written up there. What does this sign mean? <laughs> hmm. What tab? What does it show? The right atrial pressure in the the mustaqim, the capillary wedge pressure in the whole wavy. Okay? So what is, what is it showing us? During inspiration, what happens? And during expiration, what happens? During inspiration, the right atrial pressure starts to rise. 
and the capillary wedge pressure starts to come down. لما the capillary wedge pressure بيبتدي يقل طبعا بالطبيعة البلس كمان. It's all continuous thermodynamics. فيبقى ايه ف with inspiration طبيعي ان الواحد البلس يا ما بيتغيرش يا بيزيد حاجة بسيطة. انما لما لما يقل البلس during inspiration. What does that signify? أو تامبونيت مش كده؟ I think more with تامبونيت لكن ما أعرفش رأيك إيه الكوزمول ساين أكتر مع التامبونيت مش كده؟ أكتر؟ طيب Yes, yes. Constrictive pericarditis, or severe heart failure, or right status as met. So both, uh, both constrictive and temporary. Because what happens is that the flow increases into the right side of the heart with inspiration. But because the pericardium is stiff, okay, it does not allow the left side to fit. And so the, become, the pulse becomes less. Okay. What's that? This is a right atrial and right ventricular pressure. Can you see the gradient? If you shadow this area, if you shadow this area, this is the gradient, the diastolic gradient. This is during diastole. If you make a timing with the ECG, this is during diastole. The, the atrial pressure is high and the ventricular pressure is lower. Yani, there is a gradient between the two. Normally, they should be together. طبعا هتشوفوا ده كمان في اللفت سايد في المايترو سينوز يس ات از يا اوف مور ذان 5 ملم ميركوري از ذس سيجنيفيكانت تراكسبيت سينوزس اور نوت It's significant. On the right side, it's significant. On the left side, it's not significant. <laughs> okay. Yes. Yes. Exactly. هو قال لك هنا large jugular venous A waves are, no, are noted on exam. As we said, there is a giant A wave or a prominent A wave because of tricuspid stenosis. And that's why when we when we talk about um, examination, we talk about it's, a, it's an orchestra where you have to put all the instruments. The instruments are the history, the, the, the general examination, the local examination, and each one. The neck veins, the auscultation, all these are different instruments you put together to form uh, a, a musical whatever, uh, which is the diagnosis. So, so they all help each other in the diagnosis. Or uh, get away with other diagnoses. You put a differential diagnosis, and then as you go on, you remove di different diagnoses, and when you're left with one or two. And then the imaging helps to differentiate. And then you advance your right heart catheter two into the right ventricle. Okay. You see where he's pointing here. Where is that thing? Ah. Here is the QRS. You go down, 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 down. And this is the end diastolic pressure of the right ventricle with the QRS. Okay. I don't have a scale here, so I can't tell what the pressure is. But you have a scale here. Eh? So the end diastolic pressure is around 5 or 6, which is okay. 
and the peak pressure of the right ventricle is around 20, which is okay. All right. Systolic is less than 25, and the diastolic is less than 5. Okay. And this is a. I don't want to dwell too long on all these things because we have lots of things to do. Today. This is the left side. The, uh, sorry, the, the normal right ventricular waveform, as you can see, the systolic and the diastolic. And as you see the atrial pressure now, when you see the normal atrial pressure, there's no gradient between the A wave and the ventricle. Okay. Then you go to the pulmonary artery. What's the, the recent uh, definition of pulmonary hypertension? You should know that. Mean pressure of? Very good. Okay. Pulmonary arterial hypertension. Which pulmonary hypertension in general? Pulmonary arterial hypertension. 15. Very good. I uh, will stick with the pulmonary capillary wedge because I don't think we're going to do the resistance. <laughs> it's too tedious. <laughs> pulmonary capillary wedge pressure. <laughs> okay? So yeah, you have uh, an arterial pressure with a mean of, uh, of 25 and the capillary wedge pressure of less than 15. So this diagnoses arterial hypertension. In other words, it is not due to mitral stenosis. Okay? Always keep that in mind. Okay. The, what's that showing? I really don't know what the hemodynamic pathology. Pulmonary artery and right ventricle. What do you diagnose? Right. Very good. Mm -hmm. And I think command the, the, the A wave is prominent. And you know, but for right atrial wave form. Sorry, pulmonary artery, the my bench A wave. There is an A wave actually. You can see this little notch before the pulmonary artery. Again, this is the atrial contraction. You can see it. Because it has to be strong, so it's reflected in the pulmonary artery as well. Pulmonary stenosis. Notable large gradient across the pulmonary valve during pulmonary artery to right ventricular pullback and extreme increase in right ventricular systolic pressure and a damp pulmonary artery. Pressure. Micro. There you can see the, the, the pulmonary capillary wedge, which is up here. And the left ventricular end diastolic is down here. And this shaded area is microstenosis. They often do uh, balloon micro. But do they do pressures? I don't know. <laughs> I think they depend on the echo. <laughs> which is okay. I mean, you have a way to, to see what you did, which is fine. But I would still, uh, yani, it would be nice to be able to have the whole picture and you notice how, how much less the pulmonary capillary wedge pressure became after you, made a, you, you opened the balloon, balloon your valve. It would be nice. Yeah, yeah. I know, I know, there, come on, yeah, I mean, this, these things are mainly done for research, rather than practically, practically it's, logistically it's not easy, so you depend on echo and that's it. This is the same, the same, 20 millimeter gradient, slow wide descent, of course, because the mitral stenosis, so there is a slow wide descent thing. Uh, but uh, also, um, when you have a 20 millimeter gradient, what do you expect to see on the X-ray, on the chest X-ray, the lung? Veins, differential venous, uh, and then the uh, congestion, 
uh, not necessarily pulmonary edema, but the congestion in the lung, uh, maybe the curly B lines if it's a chronic uh, situation, the interstitial uh, uh, congestion in between the lung uh, lobes, they have, you know, the smahil between the two lungs. Mm, fissure, uh, the fissure is sometimes clear, edematous and clear, okay? Uh, and then, as you know, the lymphatics, when they also get congested, they form you the curly B line. In the, uh, okay? So with this 20 millimeter gradient is probably what you'll see in the chest X-ray. Again, mitral stenosis, exactly. Mitral stenosis. Big A wave. Marble. Mitral reverb. I mean, we don't do hemodynamics much for mitral reverse. You have it in the echo and everything. But if you would like to know what happens in mitral reverse hemodynamically, the V, wa the v wave is very exaggerated. Okay. And sometimes, in some cases, if it's an acute mitral reverse on a normal LV, the V wave may reach the peak of the ventricular pressure and the patient is in pulmonary edema. So, so I mean, when you have, for example, a ruptured papillary muscle, we'll do that. Okay, it's an emergency. But the ruptured cordy uh, will, yeah, I mean, will increase your V wave, of course, and cause severe mitral regurg, but not necessarily to the extent of acute pulmonary edema, unless you have more than one cordy. There is what I was just telling you. This V wave of the left atrial pressure is reaching about 70 millimeters mercury. Okay. Aortic rigors. You know aortic rigor by auscultation. You know the peripheral signs very clearly with significant aortic rigor. So your diagnosis is usually well, uh, you, you won't need hemodynamics for that, okay? Same as mitral rigor also. Constrictive physiology. Which of the following is most likely explanation for these findings that we have here? This, the top one is the pulmonary wedge pressure and the LV tracings during inspiration and expiration. The, the one on the bottom is the RV and LV tracings, inspiration and expiration. You have to choose A to E, chronic recurrent PE, constrictive pericarditis, atrial septal defect with a large shunt and right heart failure, chronic pericarditis now, Presenting with tamponade, chronic hepatitis with cirrhosis. <laughs> the one on the at the top. اللي تحت بقى with inspiration I think with inspiration the ventricle decreases its pressure تيالي شكرا بالضبط Actually, uh, 
controversies on the pulmonary veins are not included in uh, the pericardial yeah. set. So. Uh, the pulmonary veins are not affected with these lamarbifuncia uh, and lamar components. The lamar nephas kibir lungs defective. So the hawa akhtar, the dukhti damma akhtar, the rakya damma akhtar, the LV, the LV yahya. Yeah. My inspiration, which is uh, what makes him then not go into the pulmonary veins. Uh, what should we say? Hal da tamponad or the constriction? In the fact, who was tamponad? Yeah. We believe in in RV and LV are going against each other. Exactly. We did not have any method to work in the constriction of the tendons, not tamponad. Mm -hmm. In the matter of constriction, we have a certain amenity of constriction. And we actually in LV for many factors after men. We'll see. Constriction. Philippine. The Fuaniya is uh, the LV with pulmonary wedge. صح? The wedge. Yeah. فالمفروض إنه الاثنين دول تأثيرهم على مع الانسب اللفت بنترك الواضح إنه بيتأثر مع الانسبيريش واضح جدا الوج ثابت مور أو لس عشان زي ما أنت قلت بين الوجه ما فيش فهي it is it is the same tracing as the one in the bottom but the one in the bottom has the RV instead of the wedge فهي كده تمشي مع الكونستيك ولا وين انا ما بفكر في الهيمو داينامكس اي دونت سي واي ان تامبوني يو دونت جيت سيميلر سيميلر تريت الار في يعلى مع الانسبيريشن وبالتبعيه الديفيوجن ده بيخلي اللفت بانك ما يتملاش فبريشر يو هو These are the RV and LV simultaneous pressure tracings. What you notice here is, apart from the systolic pressures, all the diastolic pressures are very similar. And this is the square root sign, which is very clear for restrictive heart disease, okay? Whether it be constrictive pericarditis or uh, restrictive cardiomyopathy. The square root sign of the diastolic pressures. At lay, in atrial pressures, in pulmonary uh, diastolic pressures, will, uh, will, uh, will uh, and diastolic pressures in ventricles, the same. That restrictive syndrome, whatever it, it, it is. Laban, this is a steep uh, X descent of tamponade. The M-shaped descent of constrictive physiology. Right atrial pressure tracing bundle with the two X and Y descent and the M-shape. This is of constriction. هنا بقى اللي احنا كنا بنتكلم عنه. When respiration occurs and both both pressures increase and decrease together, it is concordant. دي تمشي مع restricted cardiomyopathy. When they are opposite to each other, تمشي مع constrictive pericarditis. Alright? يعني right ventricle is, will increase but the left ventricle will become less. Goes with constriction, of course, because the the the, 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 the pericardium is closing on the stick and closing on the ventricle. So when the right ventricle increases, it affects the filling of the left ventricle, and therefore uh, the, the, the pulse or the, the pressure becomes low. But in restrictive cardiomyopathy, are, they are concordant because it is a muscle disease rather than a constriction. Okay, that's as regards the hemodynamics. Uh, كان عندي سلايد جميلة جدا اللي هي الفرق بين أحاول أجيبها لكم الفرق بين الـ Constriction والـ Restriction on the Echo حوالي 20 حالة في الـ Echo بس 
انكلودنج السترين السترين ريت ومش عارف ايه وكل الحاجات اللي بالدوبلر وكل كل حاجه في الاخر اتس فيري نايس سلايد بس مش عارف هي فين هي هل هي معايا هنا ولا لا اي دونت نو اي دونت ثينك سو بس اي ويل Anyway, I have also something called heart songs. I will not show it today. Today, I'm not going to show it. But I have something heart songs. I'm not sure if you've heard it or not. Okay, it's here. 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 It is interesting because they are the heart sounds and murmurs and things of different cardiac diseases. So it's interesting. Who can come here and download it? I don't know about it. We need to remove this first. Yeah, stop the recording. How do you stop the recording? He was recording my voice as well. Actually, all of you were talking about this coming up.